I don't often preach from the book of Proverbs because a lot of them seem to me like pithy little sayings similar to those that one might find in a fortune cookie. And that isn't bad, don't get me wrong, there is wisdom to be found in fortune cookies, at least in some of them. But trying to find a whole sermon in a single sentence is a challenge. So to repeat, I don't often preach from Proverbs. Yet here I am on this first Sunday of Advent, and one of my sermon texts is a proverb. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. I stumbled across it in my devotional reading this past week, sort of read it and kept right on going, didn't pay much attention at first. But that one little sentence became like a grain of sand or a pebble in my shoe. You know what it's like to have a grain of sand or a pebble in your shoe. It's small, but it's there. Take another step, and it's there, uncomfortably there. Another step, another twinge, another step, another twinge, until finally you just have to stop and fish around to find out what's in there. So I went back to the proverb to fish around and find out what was in there. What was announcing itself to my subconscious? What was twinging? Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. It wasn't the second half. That part goes down comfortably enough. A desire fulfilled is a tree of life. That wouldn't be enough to settle in my subconscious like an irritant. And then I saw it. Heart sick. That was the word that was twinging. At one level, it can mean something like despondent or dejected or dispirited or deeply disappointed or disheartened or discouraged. The team felt absolutely heartsick as the ball bounced from the rim and the buzzer sounded and their Cinderella run through the tournament came to an end. But that describes heartsickness as a feeling. And I think what stuck in my subconscious was not heartsickness as a feeling, but heartsickness as something more like a diagnosis or as a lingering chronic condition, heart sick. As in, there's something broken at the core of things, heart sick. As in, something very fundamental has grown fundamentally wrong, heart sick. And I think that word grabbed me and held me because I stumbled across the proverb as I was still processing, am still processing, the shooting last Saturday at Club Q in Colorado Springs, Colorado, where a gunman killed five. Now of itself, that almost isn't even news anymore. It's commonplace enough to open the paper and discover where the mass shooting of the day occurred a high school, a synagogue, a grocery store, a movie theater, a concert, a Walmart, a college campus, some presumptively safe place that suddenly became not a safe place. But this is not yet another gun violence sermon. At least I don't think it is or intend it to be. This is a heart sickness sermon a something very wrong at the core of things sermon. You see, I think of Club Q as being more than a location where violence took place. I think of it as a symbol of or as a metaphor for much that is right in the world. Before last Saturday, Club Q was an LGBTQ nightclub that had a reputation in town a reputation as a place of acceptance, a safe haven. In an interview, the mayor of Colorado Springs described the club as a refuge for many, 
and a patron had this to say. Derek and Daniel, the bartender and bar supervisor who died in the shooting, were the light and the heart of Club Q. We don't say the LGBTQ community, we say the Club Q community, because that's what it is here in Colorado Springs. It's the Club Q community. It's a facility that gave us a safe space to be who we are all the time. And Derek and Daniel especially were always the glue, the heart that kept everything together. It wasn't just LGBTQ patients or, or patrons that they welcomed either, the patron said. If anybody was having a hard time, if anybody was new to the community, they always had open arms for everybody. Even people who weren't a part of the LGBTQ community could go there and celebrate their friendships, their allyships, because Derek and Daniel made everyone feel safe. They made everyone feel like they could be exactly who they are all the time. Now, a couple of observations. First, the word heart is mentioned twice in the comments. The light and the heart of Club Q. The heart that kept everything together. And secondly, the club frankly sounds like what any church should hope and aspire to be when it grows up. A place of refuge place of acceptance, a come as you are and as who you are sort of place. If you're new in town, you're welcome. If you're lonely, you're welcome. If you're black or if you're white, you're welcome. If you're transgendered or cisgendered or homosexual or heterosexual or bisexual, you will find unconditional acceptance here, community here. There's something life-affirming and holy about that type of love without condition. Puts me in the mind of a wonderful poem by the English poet J. Hume from his collection, The Backwater Sermons. The poem is entitled, Jesus at the Gay Bar. He's here in the midst of it. Right at the center of the dance floor, robes hitched up to his knees to make it easy to spin. And at some point in the evening, a boy will touch the hem of his robe and beg to be healed, beg to be anything other than this, and he will reach his arms out, sweat damp and weary from dance, and he'll cup the boy's face in his hand and say, my beautiful child, there is nothing in this heart of yours that ever needs to be healed. And that, it seems to me, is how everyone described Club Q, a place of caring hearts and welcoming hearts, dare I call them healthy hearts, the sort of place where a genuine, unconditional, Christ-like love might be found. And if an LGBTQ nightclub somehow embodies or symbolizes that, then the shooter might tragically be said to embody or to symbolize the opposite of that. In a place of welcome, violence, in a place of acceptance, hatred. Instead of creating community, destroying community. In a place of open, healthy, loving hearts, for whatever reason, a heart sickness. And this is important. If we as a country, or indeed as a world, have become a place where such incidents as last Saturday's shooting occur again and again and again and again and again, then maybe we collectively, as a country or a world, are heart sick. 
all the symptoms are there. Intolerance, lack of compassion, prejudice, destruction of community, division, dissension, the harboring and incubation of violence, a heart sickness within the body. Now I'm betting this isn't the sermon you came to hear. It's the first Sunday of Advent, and I'm betting you're here for the Advent sermon. Well, I'm coming to that. I said earlier, heart sickness is a diagnosis or a chronic condition, and conditions have causes, and our proverb for this morning sets forth a cause for heart sickness. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, the proverb proclaims. And let's define that or break that down. To defer something is to put it off to a later time to postpone it. To defer judgment is to hold off making a judgment until a later time. To defer a payment on a loan or a bill is to say the check is not in the mail, not at this present time. So to defer hope, well that is to say I'm not going to get my hopes up I might be, I probably will be, disappointed. It is to say, given present conditions, I'm not looking for anything to get any better anytime soon. Deferring hope is not actively investing in hope. Deferring hope is setting hope aside. Deferring hope is a failure to hope right now, maybe even to give up hope. And if enough people defer hope, then the world becomes a hopeless place and that leads to heart sickness. Because if the world is a hopeless place, then you might as well shoot it up or burn it down. If the world is a hopeless place, then we don't have neighbors or communities, we have competitors or enemies. A hope-deferred world is an us-them world. It's a red-blue world. It's a rich-poor world. It's a predator-prey world. Hope-deferred leads to cynicism and jadedness and an acceptance of the world as it is instead of any sort of investment in the world as it may yet be. It is to have no vision for the world, much less seeking God's vision for the world. It is to say, I don't have a dream. It is to deny the very presence or the promise of God's kingdom in the world. And Advent, Advent is an antidote to hopelessness the opposite of hopelessness. It is about great, grand, eschatological, world-changing hope. Advent is an assertion. Advent is an expectation that God has come and God is coming into our world, into our midst, into our mess. Advent is an assertion and an expectation that a world waiting in exile will know redemption and renewal. Advent is a countercultural symbol, light by light by light by light by light, that the true light that enlightens everyone was and is coming into the world. And it's in Advent that we speak anew and aloud powerful texts, like the one from the prophet Isaiah this morning. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be raised above all the hills and all the nations shall stream to it. And many people shall come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He 
shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore O house of Jacob Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now clearly, that grand vision has not happened. Not yet. Not fully. Only the smallest mustard seed bit of it has happened. But Advent reminds us that the vision is already present, gestating. In our hymn for this morning, we sang, O come, desire of nations, bind all peoples in one heart and mind. Bid envy, strife, and discord cease. Fill the whole world with heaven's peace. Advent is our assertion in the face of the world's heartsick hopelessness that the desire of nations has come and is coming. And as our proverb states, in contrast to a deferred hope, a desire fulfilled, the desire of nations, is a tree of life. God's vision for the world is embrace, acceptance, holiness, wholeness, a world where everyone is known and named and loved and claimed and violence is not studied or practiced. Advent is where we expect and receive anew God with us. God among us, God for us. That is our holy hope. And if we announce that hope and claim that hope and live into that hope and give voice to that hope, then it is ever before us. If we deny it or defer it, then our heart sickness will persist. O house of Jacob, come. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen.